Many want religion without the cross, faith without Christ. Much religion today is feel good about yourself faith. And that is not Christianity. The reality is, as we learned last Sunday, that religious works have no capacity to remove our sins. None. Zilch. Zero. Nada. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 as we continue our study this morning. Hebrews 10, we're picking up in verse 11. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Under the Old Testament sacrificial system, the priests were constantly on duty performing sacrifices at the altar. It was not just on the Day of Atonement once a year, Yom Kippur, but it was every day. They were performing daily sacrifices for the sins of the people. We know that, for example, by the first century, the priests were divided into 24 sections, and each section of priests took turns serving the people in the temple. Every day, all day long, animals were slaughtered on the altar to pay for the sins of the people. The temple was constant, a, a place where sacrifices were constantly be give, being given to the Lord. Now, the priests were very sincere. The people were very religious. The procedure was carried out meticulously so as to please God with the payment for sins. But these sacrifices never ever had the capacity or the capability of taking away sins. The word translated here in this verse, take away, means to remove or to do away with the sins. Ironically, this very same Greek word was used for a technical aspect of the priesthood in Judaism. The names of the priests, you see, were on lists according to their orders. And those lists were maintained so that they could have an orderly way of maintaining and managing the sacrificial system and all of the work that went on in the temple. When a priest died, there were instructions to strike the name out of the list. And that's the word that's used here, to strike the name out of the list. So just as a priest who died had his name removed from the list, so we're told sins could not be removed from the list of our lives by those sacrifices. The sacrifices could not strike out the sins in the lists of, of human lives. Just couldn't do it. They didn't have that capability. It is impossible, he has already said, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away, to strike out, to remove, to eliminate sins from our lives. Religion, in general, simply does not have the capacity to take away sins. Many people today are very religious. In fact, their religious devotion would put ours to shame many times. You look around at the world and there are some very, very devoutly religious people. And we're not talking just about Judaism. But for example, in Islam, the, prayer, the call to prayer sounds five times a day from minarets around this world. And five times a day, devout Muslims, you've seen them on the news, prostrating themselves in prayer before God. Their devotion puts ours to shame. It was expected for Muslims to make pilgrimages all the way to Mecca and Medina. Buddhists, for example, do major pilgrimages as well to prove their piety. And many have based their Christian faith not on what Christ has done for them, but on the sacramental rituals of priests and of churches 
and all of the religious issues that, and activities that take place. And that's what they base their faith upon. Devout, serious, religious, pious people. All of these religious activities demonstrate an impressive piety. But the Bible would say that they all, just like the Old Testament sacrificial system, cannot take away sins. What we do for God cannot remove our sins, no matter how devoted we are or how much we sacrifice for Him. Religious works have no capacity to remove sins. We labored that point last Sunday. And in his argument, he picks up there and he moves on. But Christ's sacrificial work lasts for all time. Verse 12. But he, that is Christ, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. You may have seen the news, the U.S. Supreme Court recently ruled with a 5-4 majority vote that a cross in the Mojave Desert was not unconstitutional as lower courts had ruled. They reversed the ruling of the lower courts, which had ruled that it was unconstitutional. The veterans of foreign wars erected the cross more than 75 years ago, but it has been covered, as this picture shows, in plywood, for the past several years because federal judges had ruled that it was unconstitutional for the cross to exist there. The state of California had transferred one acre of of public land where the cross was located to private ownership as a way to avoid the problem. And the Supreme Court ruled recently that it was an expression of private parties And so, therefore, it no longer, being located on public land, no longer violated the Constitution in every way. Now, I am glad that the Supreme Court ruled that such religious symbols are allowed under the law, that we should be able to express our faith. They should be. However, I'm a little concerned at the arguments that have come out of the case. Justice Anthony Kennedy, for example, wrote, Here one Latin cross in the desert evokes far more than religion. It evokes thousands of small crosses in foreign fields marking the graves of Americans who fell in battles. Battles whose tragedies are compounded if the fallen are forgotten. I applaud that sentiment. Certainly. But in dissenting from that, Justice John Paul Stevens agreed that soldiers who died in battle deserved a memorial to their service, but the government, he said, cannot lawfully do so by continued endorsement of a starkly sectarian message. Here's my problem. If the cross is now a symbol of those Americans who have fallen in battle, as laudable as that is, has it not? lost the meaning that is really important. The reason that it is a symbol of those who have died defending our country is because it is first a symbol of a Savior who died and therefore therefore we have hope for life evermore. The empty cross gives us hope. Because on that cross, our Savior died to pay for our sins so that we can live forever. The cross is first and foremost a symbol of Christ's death that paid for our sins, just as Hebrews says. So, if it becomes a symbol of anything else, then it's losing the sense of what it's really all about. And that concerns me. Christ offered his one sacrifice for our sins on the cross for all time, forever, and that is the meaning of the cross. 
Hebrews is drawing a sharp contrast between the cross work of Christ and the sacrifices of the priests. The priests perform sacrifices every day for the sins of the people, seven days a week, 365 days a year. There was no end to the religious sacrifices being performed. Furthermore, these priests performed their work standing. Every priest, he says, stands daily in the temple, we're told in verse 11. And many have observed over the years that there were no chairs in the tabernacle or in the temple, in that area, the holy place. There were no chairs there because the priests were always at work standing. They were always there at work because sin was never taken away. But Christ, he says, after he offered the sacrifice of his body on the cross for our sins, what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. His sacrificial work was finished. There was no need for any more sacrifice for sins. The price was paid for our sins and the sins of all humanity on the cross once for all time. There is no perpetual sacrifice for sins. Christ is not continuing to pay for our sins. Christ died once for all time. And any religious ritual that claims to pay for our sins is false. We celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. This this act does not pay for your sins. Christ's death paid for our sins. We remember and worship Him in gratitude. This act is not sacramental. It does not pay for your sins. There is no perpetual sacrifice for sins. Once that payment was made by Jesus as our high priest, he sat down because his sacrificial work was completed forever. His work was finished, done. And Christ is sitting on the right hand of God, and we learned earlier in Hebrews, he's seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us, and for our needs, and advocating for us to the Father, awaiting the day when his enemies will become a footstool for his feet. I mean, one day, one day, and it's coming, The Bible tells us that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That day is coming. But until that day comes, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father because His work is finished. He doesn't have to pay anything more for your sins or mine. His work on the cross lasts for all time. We cannot sin so badly that Christ has to go back to work to pay for our sins. You can't do anything so bad that Christ has to go back to work to pay for your sins. There is no sin we can commit that is beyond the capacity of His grace already paid for on the cross. Do you believe that? It is all paid once for all time. What a blessed truth. You don't have to worry that what you've just done, oh my goodness, Jesus says, i got to get up and go to work again. He doesn't have to do that for you. He doesn't have to pay any more for you. It's already paid. And he is seated at the right hand of God the Father, unlike the priests. Last Sunday, Pastor Hopkins was in church with us, and he sent me an email this week because he was looking ahead to this passage. He was excited about this passage in Hebrews. And he noted the posture of our eternal high priest who sat down after his work was done, and then he wrote, And I believe that's the posture of our great high priest, except for Acts 7, 55 and 56, when Stephen the martyr testified that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What a welcome into the Savior's presence. Now think about that for a minute. He's right. The picture we have is of a Savior who is seated because His work is finished. 
But folks, when we come home, our Savior does what? Stands to welcome us into his home. What a blessed picture. Jesus is seated on his heavenly throne. But one day, when you or I arrive in heaven, our Lord and Savior, the one before whom the whole world will bow one day, will stand to greet us with open arms and words of welcome. Right? Won't that be a glorious day? When we enter his presence forever because of his work on the cross for all time? That's our Christian faith. Why? Why is it going to be? Because, third, we are made perfect by Christ's perfect work. Verse 14, For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. The verb translated perfected means to complete a task or accomplish a goal or bring to an end what one has started. Christ accomplished his goal for us on the cross. The Greek construction is a past tense here with continuing results. That means that when Christ died on the cross, he has made us perfect. He accomplished his goal of perfecting us on the cross. That event in the past has ongoing results for us today. It is already done. It is already completed. It is finished. He does not have to offer any more sacrifices to finish the task of perfecting us. He is, his one offering perfected us forever, he says. We are made perfect by Christ's perfect work. C.S. Lewis wrote, it cost God nothing so far as we know to create nice things, all of this creation. But to convert rebellious wills cost him crucifixion. You say, well, Dave, I'm not perfect. I still sin. I don't think the sacrifice worked for me. I know what you mean. I, too, still sin. But I'm here to tell you that his sacrifice was sufficient for you. And for me, for all your sins, even the sins you have yet to commit. I want you also to know that you are made perfect by his perfect work. The verse goes on to say, he has perfected us for all time. He has perfected those who are sanctified. Now, the problem with English translations is that they don't always bring out the force of the Greek text. We can translate this phrase this way. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Did you catch the force? This is a process. The word for being sanctified means to eliminate anything that is incompatible with his holiness. To purify. To eliminate anything that is incompatible with God's holiness. And that is a process. And this process is an ongoing process based upon what Christ has already done for us on the cross. Now the payment is complete, but the process is ongoing. Christ has perfected us positionally in Him. He is continuing to purify us of anything that is incompatible with His holiness as we walk through life. Both statements are theologically true. You see, there are three tenses to salvation in the Scriptures. We have been saved in the past. We are being saved in the present. And we will be saved in the future. Or we could put it this way, we have been saved from the penalty of sin in the past. That's already accomplished. We are being saved from the power of sin in our lives. And we will be saved from the presence of sin when Christ returns or we go to Him. It is all by His work for us and not our work for Him. We are made perfect by Christ's perfect work. 
According to Leith Anderson, there is a road in western Colorado called the Million Dollar Highway. Most people would assume that the road got its name. Do you know of this road? Most people assume that... Uh, don't correct me if I'm wrong, because it'll ruin the illustration, you know. But this is what Leith Anderson said. <laughs> Most people assume that, that the road got its name because it was very expensive to build, and apparently the terrain was pretty substantial, so it was expensive. But the real reason it's called the Million Dollar Highway, he said, is because waste material from the ore in gold mines was used for the bed of the highway. And not all the gold dust and the nuggets were removed from it because the mining processes at the time couldn't purify it that much. You couldn't get all of that out. As a result, there is a partial roadbed of gold that is probably worth a lot more than a million dollars. Now, is that right? Sounds good? Okay. It isn't the cost that gave it, gave it its name. It's what's in it, the value. The value of our salvation in Christ comes not just by the price that he paid for us, and he did pay an expensive price, did he not? On the cross. But from the perfection he gives us, he invests in us. That's the beautiful value. His perfection invested in you is of infinite value. The price Christ paid on the cross was expensive. The perfection Christ gives us forever is priceless. Our lives are founded on His priceless perfection invested in you for all of eternity. Christ's cross work forth changes the motives for our works. Verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and upon their mind I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So this is the investment that God makes in us. This is the roadbed of value that He's invested in you right here. It's another quotation, another time he quotes from Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah 31, and the New Covenant, which we celebrate this morning, the New Covenant in Christ. The Israelites certainly should have understood that a new covenant or a new contract was coming because Jeremiah predicted it 600 years before Christ died on the cross. God tells us that he will make this new covenant, this new contract with his people through Christ. Christ is the mediator of a new covenant with God. And this covenant is a last will and testament. And that means that the testator had to die in order for the terms of the covenant to be enacted. And he's already developed that argument. So Jesus Christ, as the testator, had to die in order for the, last, the terms of the last will and testament to be enacted for us. He had to die to enact the new covenant. Now there are three accomplishments of this new contract that God makes with us through the death of Christ. First, he tells us that I will produce my laws on their hearts. I will put my laws on their hearts. The, the verb put means to produce, like crops growing in a field. It can also mean to institute or cause to come into existence. God will cause His laws to be produced in our hearts like crops grow in a field, in a farmer's field. He will institute those laws inside of us. The motivation then for obeying God will not come from outside, it will come from inside of us. We will want to follow God's laws because we will have a heart that is producing the obedience to those laws. Second, he says, I will write them on their minds. We won't need stone tablets for the laws of God. We won't need pen and paper. Why? Because he will write those laws on our minds, and He will 
institute them, cause them to come into existence in our hearts. We'll not be able to forget those laws. All of that teaches us that we will be changed from the inside out. We will want to obey God because we will have hearts and minds tuned to God and His will. So the motive for all that we do will come from our changed hearts, our renewed minds. We are changed by His love. We sung that this morning already. And by His grace. It produces a change. And real Christians are people who have been changed from the inside out. We say every Christian is born again. What does that mean? It says it means that we have a new heart. We have a new mind. A new way of operating. We are new people. Now we want to follow God because He has put all of that into our hearts and our minds. We know that ex- that experience imperfectly, certainly right now. But when Christ completes this whole process, when the new covenant is finally completed, we will know that experience perfectly forever. And the third accomplishment of the new covenant, I will remember their sins no more. What a great statement, isn't it? God tells us, I will remember your sins no more. Forgiveness is such a blessed truth. All of our sins, all of our lawless acts, all of those messes we make, God no longer keeps them in mind. In fact, the verse is doubly emphatic in the Greek. Literally says, I will no, not, still keep them in mind. No way! I'm not even going to keep them in mind. I won't hold it against you because I'm not, in, I'm not keeping it in memory. I'm not keeping it in my mind as I relate to you. They will never again be a factor. He has wiped the slate clean in Christ, your slate and mine. Now, we are motivated not because we're trying to earn our way back into his favor, right? You know, that's the way many people, in fact, religion in general operates on that guilt motive. You feel guilty, so now you're working so hard to prove yourself to God and earn back what you've messed up in life, and it never works. That's not the motive for a Christian anymore. The motive for a Christian is gratitude. It's thanks, it's praise for what he has done. For whom much has been forgiven, there is much to be thankful for. We serve in gratitude then for his forgiveness. Christ's cross work changes the motives for our works. Look at verses 22 to 25, because we're headed there. We haven't gotten there yet. But down in verse 22, he says, Let us draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, what he has done for us is supposed to produce good works, yes. But the works are done out of gratitude, out of thanks, out of appreciation for what he's done, not as a way to earn his favor back. And that's a whole different motive, isn't it? April 18, 1942. Army Corporal Jacob DeShazer boarded a bomber plane with his pilot, Lieutenant William Farrell, and a co-pilot, a navigator, and a rear gunner. Their mission was to bomb Tokyo and the surrounding cities. The bombing was a success, but with fuel running low, Lieutenant Farrow gave the order for all on board to jump. DeShazer made a safe landing. He was taken prisoner by 10 Japanese soldiers shortly thereafter. Though his life was spared, he was tortured ruthlessly before being placed in solitary confinement at a filthy prison camp. 
De Cesar remained in captivity to the Japanese for almost two years. When, uh, where he almost died of starvation, of illness. It was uh, just a horrific place of torture. There was, however, one Bible in the entire prison camp. And since they didn't have much to do, everybody wanted to at least read. It took him six months to get to his turn to read the Bible in that prison camp. But when he did, he began to read the scriptures over and over again. He had been raised in a Christian home, but he had never accepted Christ as his personal Savior. On the final day that he was allowed to have the Bible, he read Romans 10.9 once more. He confessed his faith in Christ, and he begged for God's forgiveness. From that day on, he became a follower of Christ in the prison camp. And it changed how he tried to relate to his captors and to his fellow prisoners. A year after his conversion, June 1945, the Americans were transferred to a prison in Beijing, and conditions were even worse. He nearly died of starvation and disease, but he was growing spiritually. As like Daniel, he prayed every day. August 6, 1945, the day the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, DeShazer woke up about 7 a.m. He was impressed to pray for peace that day. At 2 in the afternoon, the Holy Spirit told the prisoner, you don't need to pray anymore, the victory is won. (laughs) He said it was a lot better to hear the news from God than it was from the radio. In 1948, guess what he did? Jacob de Chaser went back to Japan with his wife as a missionary, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Florence and Jacob served there. It was interesting because army chaplains had already distributed more than a million tracts containing DeShazer's testimony titled, I was a prisoner of the Japanese, and now he was going back to Japan. Thousands of Japanese people wanted to see the man who could forgive his enemies. And so they came to listen to his message. In his first few months in Japan, the former bomber spoke in over 200 places, and soon he, his wife Florence helped Japanese Christians to establish a number of churches. Then early in 1950, a man came to his home and introduced himself. His name was Mitsuo Fushida, flight commander of the 360 planes that attacked Pearl Harbor. After reading DeShazer's testimony, Fushida had purchased a New Testament, read it, And he had accepted Christ, and he had come to talk with his new brother in Christ. DeSager welcomed him, counseled him. He was baptized. With a short time, Fushida became an evangelist preaching in Japan and all over the world. The grace of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Isn't God amazing? In 1959, a dream came true for Jacob DeSager when he moved to Nagoya, Japan, to establish a Christian church in the very city that he had bombed. And now he was offering the peace of Christ. Because of one shared Bible in a horrific prison camp. And the grace of Jesus Christ had changed a man's life. He was forgiven, and so he could forgive. That's what forgiveness does. Forgiveness breeds forgiveness. The new covenant produces a whole new life. And that's what we're celebrating this morning. Look at verse 18. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Christ's forgiveness renders our works irrelevant for salvation. We no longer serve to earn God's favor. Now we serve because God has granted us forgiveness by His grace. There's no more sacrifice for sin that we can perform. Now our sacrifices are what? Sacrifices of praise for all He's done for us. Because we've been forgiven, we now can offer forgiveness to everyone else. 
flat broke and homeless, brothers Giza and Slot Pilati literally lived in a cave near Budapest for many, many years. They left their cave home only to gather up scrap metal to sell to buy a few pieces of food. It was a hopeless situation. And then one day everything changed. Out of the blue, charity workers found them and informed the brothers that they had inherited a substantial portion of their late maternal grandmother's $6.6 billion estate. They went from living in a cave to living in a palace overnight. Folks, we are mega gazillionaires in Christ. And it wasn't from anything we did. We have been forgiven everything by His grace. We enjoy life forever by His work, not our work. And His work is finished for all time. All we can do is celebrate His forgiveness by the lives we live for Him. And that's what we do this morning. We celebrate His forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for Your grace that sets us free. For Your forgiveness for all we have done against You. And may we celebrate that forgiveness this morning. May You fill our lives with Your joy and Your grace and Your forgiving nature as we relate one to another. In Jesus' name, amen.